Are you ready to learn? Because my super experienced guests are ready to share some really valuable information. Make sure and listen all the way to the end to get help and support. So let's start with the best audio experience. How to increase conversion rate optimization. It's very important today, not only to get traffic, it's more important how you can sell this traffic, how you can monetize your efforts by creating content, because we often see when websites, companies are looking for ways to get more traffic. But guys, <laughs> you don't need traffic if this traffic uh, doesn't sell. That's why I'm so excited to discuss this topic with Will Lowerson. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, big pleasure to speak with you again. I remember all this valuable insights from our first episode. So I'm looking, learning more. And uh, Will, before we start, just Remind about yourself, experience, background, about your business, and why you pay so much attention to uh, conversion rate optimization. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, Will Lawrence, and um, I run Customers Who Click. We're a conversion rate optimization agency for uh, e-commerce brands. Um, I got into this. So, I, I was in startups originally. That's that's where I, I my, that's my background and. Basically, pretty much every place I worked at um, had the same thing. It was we were given quite a decent budget, you know, given decent marketing budget to spend. But it was essentially um, your job as marketing is to go and acquire customers. Yeah, makes sense. But the only thing we were given to do that was the budget, right? So it was just, and I'm sure you're aware with startups, um, as as are a lot of the listeners, you know nothing's perfect nothing's even close to being perfect so you know messaging tends to be wrong um you know there can be issues with the the product itself the the purchase journeys people go through so i started to you know we stumbled across some of these these blocks and i started to think well you know looking at the data so one of the startups i worked at was a, a digital product so i could literally see like every touch point a customer had Right, from sign up all the way through to to every interaction they have with our product and i could see that you know people were dropping off at various stages people weren't actually engaging with the product enough so i started to say well you know we need to fix this because our, our marketing metrics kind of top you know, to, uh, top level marketing metrics look good right we're getting good cl good click through rates on on our advertisements um we're getting good sign up rates on our landing pages and then that's where then we're seeing drop off after that and this happened at a few businesses. So I started to get more and more involved in, in the product team, um, but also doing more just customer research myself and actually you know, sending out some surveys to people, finding out why they didn't purchase or why they did purchase. Um, you know, what problems were they having on the website, running interviews with them, and then using that feedback to go back to the product and the team and say, this is where we've got a problem. Now, like people, people can't find what they're looking for. We've, we've, got, to, um, we've got to develop the discoverability inside our product um, and then I left my last job uh, just over three years ago yeah about three and a half years ago to start customers who click um, yeah and uh, I've been doing that ever since nice nice Will you know I like the name of company customers who click awesome <laughs> can you describe uh, why you decided to name company like this and uh, how it's important to get customers who click <laughs> Uh, so the name, uh, the name was actually the name for the podcast, my, my podcast originally. Mm -hmm. um, and then about six months later, I realized I was marketing two brands and what's the point of that? Uh, so I, I ditched the, the other name, um, which was monkey blocks, um, which it was to be honest, just a completely random name that I came up with. Uh, so I ditched that and, and started to use customers who click as as the name for both the agency and the podcast mm -hmm. nice nice okay let's talk about creating the right strategy you know i i often see when companies are looking for ways how to get more traffic or uh, how to get high engagement comments likes something like that but uh, it doesn't help to convert to bring more sales and uh, I don't care if I get million traffic uh, and uh, without sales. I care if I get, uh, let's call 100 people. But if I convert, if I can sell, it's uh, I can get back 
uh, for, uh, for my efforts. So can you tell how to create the strategy, how to find the right metrics? Because you mentioned about marketing metrics, but I, I can divide uh, marketing metrics uh, two categories, vanity metrics and uh, when you know what you need to do. So any tips about creating the right strategy? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to whatever whatever the, the big goal is for whatever you're doing. And most of the time, that's going to be sales. That's, you know, that's the only thing that really matters. So while some campaigns might be with the aim of doing something else, the end goal is still is still sales. So if you decide to run a lead generation campaign, for example, you know, like you were saying, you might drive loads of traffic to it. You might do really well there. It might convert to 50 percent. So you end up with 10,000 leads. Um, but it turns out you run a competition for a, a, a new Mac through a, you know, a, a social sharing widget. So you've got loads of shares on Twitter, all that sort of stuff. People, people kept signing up and then no one actually then buys your product because it was a completely irrelevant uh, competition for your product. So you look at it and you go, oh, we did really well. We generated 10,000 leads. But actually, if you've if you've sold nothing, then it was a complete waste of time. So I'd say it's, it's it's always got to come back to to sales. That said, I actually did a post uh, on LinkedIn. I think it was was it this morning? Was it yesterday? I think it was this morning. Um, about yeah, it was today. Um, about how yeah, loads of brands want to say uh, we need to improve our conversion rate. Where do we start? Where do we where do we get going with this? And it's the wrong way of looking at it. Because if you approach it from the point of view of, uh, you know, our website conversion rate is one percent, we want to we want to increase that. We want to make it two percent, three percent, whatever. Uh, where do you yeah? Where do you start with that? Right? There's so much research you can do. There's so many um, little tweaks and changes you can make to your website. You know, you've got probably five or six different page types to consider in the purchase journey. You know, homepage, PLP, PDP, cart. Maybe check out one, check out two. That's six different pages. You might have a third checkout page. So if you just think of it from the point of view of how do we improve conversion rate, that makes it difficult to then take action. So you do need to split that down and say, well, you know, where is the biggest drop off in our funnel? That's where we need to target. And you can even get, you know, super, super like granular with it. So if you if you're looking at um add to cart rate. Right. Let's say your add to cart rate is low and you're thinking, OK, we've got a problem with our product pages. That's still quite broad, right? Because the question then is what's wrong with our product pages? But if you can narrow it down to um, people don't trust, there's, there's a lack of trust on the page, then that tells you, OK, well, we can come up with five or six test ideas around reviews, social proof uh, and general trust of the business. And then that, that's giving you your your areas to target so you're kind of in in your mind i suppose your goal for that campaign is to improve trust but obviously you're still then doing it with the, with the end goal of sales in mind mm -hmm. right. nice. yeah. you, you kind of the, the end goal is always going to be that sale and getting that sale but you can just approach it from a more granular point of view of saying right what's what's one little thing we want to improve on the website that is then going to have that knock on effect and improve conversion. Nice, nice. Love it. Valuable. I'm interested about uh, simplicity. You know, when I check out landing pages from Apple, BMW, many other well known brands, they don't write a lot of words, just share a few words like make difference. I don't know, something like that. So, uh, less words but nice looking design and very simple. You know, it's so simple to consume this design. Can you tell about simplicity, how to create content uh, and write text for uh, landing pages uh, that is simple to consume, that don't confuse customers? Because, you know, I see this issue when customers don't know what to click, where to go, what to do. You know, uh, for example, when companies uh, try to sell almost all their products from one landing page, uh, from home page. Uh, but, you know, if I open apple.com, I can see only iPhone. iPhone is responsible for 40% uh, of all uh, 
uh, Apple sales. So why Apple needs to show MacBook AirPods in the first visible screen if uh, Apple can bring a lot more sales? It's simple to consume. Can, can you tell about simplicity? How to find the balance between sharing a lot of details and uh, just be simple as much as possible? Because, you know, people might know Apple. I know Apple. I have iPhone, Apple Watch, AirPod, uh, two MacBooks, a lot of stuff from Apple. But, you know, I think that I know this brand. Uh, and uh, But, you know, sometimes customers don't know. So can you tell how to learn customers to create simple content? Yeah, so I, th I think the first thing to acknowledge there is that, yeah, Apple is one of the biggest brands in the world. They can get away with not saying as much because they, you know, the words they do use are highly impactful and they don't have to expand on that much. Um, and part of that is probably great copywriting and great design on the page. But also, yeah, they benefit from the fact that it's Apple. And people who buy, people who buy Apple iPhones are probably always just going to buy Apple iPhones. So really for them, it's probably probably more of a functional information thing where, you know, if I want to replace my phone because it's absolutely smashed, um, I'm, I'm going to buy an iPhone. So I'm going to go to the Apple website and it's literally just a case of which one of these functionally does what I need it to do. So they don't really, they don't need to sell me on the fancy stuff. They don't need to tell me how my life is going to be so much better with this product. So I already know that I'm happy with that. I just want to buy, I just want to make sure I'm buying the right size of phone, the right, you know, the right storage for me. But when it comes to other brands, um, where, where people don't know you so much, then yeah, you have to, you have to work a bit harder to sell. You've got to use imagery. You've got to use copy and there's, yeah, you've got to find that balance of keeping it simple, but I don't think that means you have to have fewer words necessarily. It just means that the words you use have to be impactful. So, you know, one great exercise is just to go through a website and see how many words you can cut out and, and the sentence and the paragraphs still make perfect sense. Because that's it's the problem a lot of brands have, right? You, you can go through product descriptions and just cut out so many extra words that, that just don't need to be there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think... There's kind of simplicity, but I think from a design point of view, you just don't want things cluttered. That's that for me is is where where you do get a problem where there, there are just too many things going on on that page, um, and and nothing stands out. And so this this is more just a design hierarchy thing, really. If you can't, you know, if you land on a homepage, for example, and you cannot see exactly what you're supposed to do within a couple of seconds, you're probably going to bounce. So if I can't see a call to action. Um, if I can't see the navigation or a search bar or anything, I'm probably just going to bounce because I don't know where to go. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there are one thing that annoys me is certain SaaS tools, for some reason, don't have a login on their mobile site. And it's, it's possibly because the experience is terrible once you log in, because they don't optimize the dashboard for mobile because they don't expect people to use it. But it means that, you know, if I want to go just check check some account settings or something i can't do it and it's just frustrating right so that stuff the stuff has to be there um and it's it's got to be in you know where i expect it to be really nice nice yeah love it love it uh you mentioned this word bounce and you know customers never hesitate to bounce if they don't understand content so yeah. it's simple to bounce and forget forever for <laughs> about this website and go to some other places uh, when competitors can provide a much better user experience customers experience so that's why yeah, I, mean, I usually yeah I, go I, ahead. I say that you know if if someone's in the mood to buy you get one chance to convert them because if you if you mess it up on your website and they go somewhere else, they're going to buy from that company. Depending on like, you know, if they then have a good experience from that company, they might stay loyal and keep buying. In which case, they won't come back to you. Uh, if it's a very infrequent purchase, then obviously you've lost that experience. You know, if you're buying a mattress, for example, if you've got that one ex one chance to sell someone a mattress. If you mess it up and they buy some from someone else, you're probably never, ever going to get a sale from that person. 
because the next matches yeah. they buy could be 10, 15 years away. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think, yeah, you, you've got to get it right. And, you know, when people are browsing, you've got a little bit more leeway on it. And uh, because they, if they bounce from you, they might bounce from another site, you know, they might just do some window shopping, or whatever. They might come back a bit later and you know, they might come back through an advert or, um, or, or just a different link and, and find what they are looking for. Right. Mm-hmm. But obviously you're taking a risk with that. Nice. Right. Nice. Uh, let's talk about, uh, human touch about, uh, you know, uh, 75% of all decisions, uh, are coming from emotions and 25%, uh, are logic. And, you know, uh, I, I felt that I'm a logic man, but when I watch a new presentation about a new Apple watch, when Tim Cook shared three stories, how Apple watch can decide my problems, you know, after that. I bought three pairs for me, for my wife, for my son, uh, because these guys probably kill me if I buy only for myself. But, uh, you know, uh, I got the feeling of owning this Apple Watch. I got it. I need to have them. I need to decide some of my problems to simplify my life, many other things. Uh, and that was uh, emotions, not logic. I didn't know about special features. I didn't know about many other things that Apple Watch can do, but I know it can help me to go ahead to overcome obstacles, challenges that I have. Can you create about creating the feeling to, uh, because, you know, I see when companies share a lot of features now, so many features. And uh, for example, uh, when I watch uh, a new BMW, that was interesting that uh, from this marketing, I found uh, that I didn't know features about new BMW, but I, uh, I saw uh, a happy man who can drive this car, you know, and uh, uh, he he can feel so happy, you know, to have this car, to own this car. So can you tell about creating the feeling of owning something? Yeah, I think it's obviously, it's, it massively changes depending on what you're buying, right? So using the car example, uh, my purchase was a, a more emotional uh, decision, right? I, I went with the Tesla because I wanted a Tesla. That was pretty much it. I mean, the, all right, it was slightly functional because I knew it was a longer range electric vehicle, which which was a, a quite a key thing. Um, but if you're looking at more, I suppose the lower end of the market, you know, I don't know how much. Yeah, it's difficult to say with like cars and things. You know, if, I, if I'm looking at, I don't know, a Ford Focus and a, and a VW Golf, um, I'm probably going to go with the VW Golf because I see it as the better brand. But that's mm-hmm. probably the only thing. Whereas, you know, feature-wise, I probably don't care. I'm, I'm assuming they are, for all intents and purposes, the same car, uh, really. You know, probably the speeds are about the same. You know, there, there might be some minor differences, but it's not going to make, it's not really going to make an impact on my life. So... I think it, it depends on the products you're looking at, but motivation. Uh, so, so I, I talk about three areas. Well, we, we target three areas when we're, when we're doing optimization, which is usability, anxiety, and motivation. So this, this is the area that comes under motivation, which is, yeah, how do we get people excited about a product? The functional stuff, so the features, actually falls into the anxiety piece, right? Because my anxieties are, is this the right product for me? Is it going to do what I need it to do? Is it, you know, is it the right size, you know, phone wise, for example, um, is it going to be too big to fit in my pocket? Am I going to have enough storage space? Right, that's, that's anxiety stuff. That's features and functional. The motivation stuff is, yeah, that's the, how is your life going to be better because you've got this product, right? And yeah. that's, that's where it comes, it comes down a bit to, to doing customer research and finding out what people actually care about. Yeah, yeah, right. and, nice, and, nice. And it and it's difficult, right? Because you have mm. to. I was actually talking to someone earlier about this. You have to really understand what someone means when they're when they're mm-hmm. giving you feedback, and that's why I think um, I'm going slightly off topic. Uh, but that's why I'm not convinced by the use of things like AI, um, AI tools and things in analyzing customer feedback, because I don't think the tools are good enough to understand what someone really means. <laughs> they're saying yeah. when they're talking to you and sometimes you you literally can only get that by being on a video call with them 
because mm-hmm. they might yeah. you know they might say something that's that they might say something is really important to them but you can tell by the look on their face that's actually not not something they're that interested in because there's something else they've mentioned which is when they kept talking and the fact that they yeah. kept talking about thing something it's like oh hang on but that's more important to you then so why is that more important to you so yes. yeah i mean it's it, it's difficult to say exactly how you do it on, on just a podcast but yeah it's it's speaking to customers finding out what's what's important to them when when buying a product like this and uh and then trying to use that copy or use that that language in your copy in your images as well to to create that feeling nice nice yeah love it love it uh you mentioned about ai uh i agree with you about using ai uh, you need to use ai in smart way for example i see when yeah. people overuse ai like golden button silver bullet you know but ai is not <laughs> uh, uh, the tool that can decide all things uh, to create and market content uh, but it's a big help for me it's help uh, because i use ai i used before chat gpt uh, Today, I use ChatGPT. Uh, we created our uh, AI tool that can help to create content for all website pages. It's called it's called Golden Button. Guys, it's not Golden Button. <laughs> you know, you need to edit to provide something new because AI is good. Uh, f- for example, uh, I usually use AI to translate and edit text. For example, if I can build yeah. my thoughts, I can add all this mess to ai and tell please <laughs> create something that it's uh simple to read you know because uh, when you have this mess it, it's really hard or for headlines so ma- many things you can I, do i found i found for yeah. my podcast um i use a tool and it is so I, i've used two and this this new one's a lot better it is really really good at transcribing the podcast like really good so Sometimes it struggles with a person's name because it just doesn't know how to spell that person's name. But what I found is it's so good at stripping out the extra, the extra words and things. So when, you know, when people repeat things a little bit, it kind of looks at that and says, oh, we don't need that. So we can cut that out and it makes more sense. So it's really good for that. And it creates outlines of summaries and the blog post, right? You can't use them because they're so bland. And like, there's no, there's no tone of voice uh, produced by these by these tools, but at least it gives you the outline, and then you can just make your tweaks and things. But you know, if we, if I did an interview with someone, and said, you know, what what is the most important thing to you about this product or buying this product? The AI tool, I imagine, would tell me uh, the answer to that question is whatever they say next. Right, it's it not. You know, I can't say this for certain, but obviously, but you know, my experience with with this tool for my for my podcast and a couple of others that I've used, it just can't. Yeah, they're, they're struggling a bit with with some of the context and and the way people are saying things. Um, mm-hmm. And and so you know, you you might find through the conversation that they actually say something else is the most important thing to them. But but the fact that you've asked the question they aren't they give an answer that seems to be the thing that that a lot of tools will pull out nice nice can you share your prompts that you use uh to ask uh ai to i don't know to uh transfer your podcast uh subtitles or uh captions yeah? oh, I, don't, uh, I, I don't have to um i just upload the audio file and it just does it so it's got mm-hmm. it's all because it's all built in so i, I don't use you know Mm-hmm. chat you you know the open ai or whatever um mm-hmm. i've got a tool so literally i've got to upload the mp3 and it'll give me transcriptions summary time mm-hmm. uh time stamps uh a blog post right. social posts but they're terrible um and some titles example titles so for that mm-hmm. for that it's really good because it, it saves it probably saves me about an hour of of work on the podcast um mm-hmm. Yeah, which is yeah. obviously great. Okay, Will, I open your LinkedIn profile because I love opening LinkedIn profiles and I like your message uh, in bio, helping e-commerce brands unlock extra revenue through conversion rate optimization. 
let's talk more about that. That means, for example, if companies have sales, uh, everything looks fine. But I found uh, a lot of case studies that share how you can get more sales, you know, by uh, fixing something in your uh, content, uh, fixing the message or call to action. Can you tell how uh, the process looks like? I mean, like, for example, if you got uh, uh, e-commerce page and what you do next to figure out how to improve conversion rate optimization? Yeah, so um, everything starts with research, as I mentioned earlier. So we tend to do um, analytical research. So Google Analytics, for example, looking at uh, any quick wins. So are there any devices that aren't working properly, any browsers, um, any channels that are that are potentially an issue? You know, are we seeing a lot of traffic driven by some sort of affiliate or, or whatever that is just trash uh, of um, traffic? Now, obviously, that is a it's not really a proper way of introducing of improving conversion rate because it's not if we remove that traffic because it doesn't actually generate more revenue it just removes some traffic right so the conversion is going to go up a little bit but we're looking for those opportunities but then mainly we're looking for the e-commerce conversion funnel where are we seeing the drop off and i would say vast amount of time uh, it tends to be the product pages so people well yeah, most of the time it's people get into a product page and then not adding to cart. And, mm. you know, it's quite, I mean, I could go on about this for hours, to be honest, but it doesn't always mean it's a uh, product page issue, necessarily not with, with, with that product page. Um, it could just be that it's the wrong product and they can't find what they're looking for. Right. Mm. So there's a lot of complexities to it, but essentially we're looking for, you know, where do we think the drop off is in the funnel? Then we'll look at behavioral stuff. So if we have identified product pages as a problem, we will look at heat maps, session recordings, scroll maps, things like that on those product pages to say, right, out of all the important assets on this page and elements on this page, which ones are they seeing? Which ones are they not seeing? What are they interacting with? What are they not interacting with? You know, and, and trying to work out where we think there might be uh, some issues here. And then of course we we do the customer research so that is uh surveys uh exit intent uh, sorry exit intent surveys on on the website and customer interviews and there we're looking for things like you know what is the number one reason you didn't purchase from the website uh, on the exit intent it'll be you know what's the main reason you haven't purchased today I and mean, so then you get that direct feedback of you know i couldn't work out um what the battery um time would be on this phone right so mm -hmm. that's obviously an important thing to them if they're saying that you know double check it is it on the website no okay we need to we need, we need to get at least get this on there but then obviously you go a bit further and you say well what, what would be the best way of actually presenting this information is it a bullet point of text or is it some sort of uh, image or something that's um that would appeal to people um so that's customer research and then we go about testing so that's when we we target those three areas I mentioned earlier. So usability, anxiety, motivation. Usability mm -hmm. simply, how does the website work? Does it is it easy for me to find what I'm looking for and make my purchase? It's yeah, it's 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 the most important thing really. So you know, like I was saying, some people might get to a product page and they drop off because you know a lot of brands advertise directly to products. So if I land on that product page and I say, oh, no, this this one's not quite the one for me, where do I go from here? If they can't then work out where to go, you know, because they can't see the navigation, they can't work out how to get back to the the shop all page or anything, that's going to cause drop off. So usability mm -hmm. is around, yeah, like can, can people find what they're looking for? Can they add them to cart? And, uh, and can they make that purchase? Uh, then we've got anxiety, which is the questions and concerns. Right, so questions about the product tend to be the the more um, functional stuff, right? Is this is this the right product for me? Is it going to do the job that I need it to do? Um, you know, it could be how do I install it? But there, there can also be some post purchase information that people need, depending on what the product is. You know, if, um, if someone is buying a custom PC, for example, they might want to know, well, you know, how does this actually arrive? I mean, what you know. 
do I receive all the different parts and I've got to put it together myself? Do you send it as a completed PC? So I've just literally got to plug it in. Um, and then also it could be, how do I maintain it over time? Right, so um, try and think of an example. I don't know, a motorbike or something. I don't know why I use that example. I don't drive one. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it, products where you think, right, um, what do I need to do in six months time? Oh, perfect. Oh, I've got an example because I've worked on this. Um, lighting. I work with a lighting brand and we got lots of people actually asking um, or saying, I don't know what bulb this light needs. So what happens when I need to replace it? Right. And because these bulbs were, you know, that was, it was kind of designer lighting. So some of them were weird shapes and things, you know, it's not, it's not a simple screw in bulb or anything. So it was quite rightly, the question was, okay, what happens if this breaks? How do I replace the, the bulb? So if that information is not on the page. They don't know the answer to it. They can't make the purchase. So mm -hmm. they're going to try and get in touch and hope they work it out or they're going to go somewhere else. Um, and then uh, there's also social proof and things that all helps with anxiety. Um, but also it's anxiety about the business they're buying from. So, you know, this this works particularly for uh, brands that are less less well known, um, which, you know, to be honest, is is most brands. Um, I, you know, I look at the product, the reviews are great, the pictures are great, it looks like exactly what I need. I can see in the product description, it fits my requirements, it's got the specifications I need. And then I think, but I don't have a clue who this business is. Um, the website looks a bit rubbish. I can't see how to contact the business. Um, they've only got an Instagram account or worse, it'd be like only a Twitter account with about you know, 300 followers or something. These are all things that make you think, you know, is it, is it a legit business? How long have they been around? And of course, with the how long have they been around question, it's also how long will they be around? So if they're a brand new business and they've only been around, uh, you know, if, if you think a few months, you might think, well, it's great that you've got a one year returns policy or lifetime guarantee or something. But if I don't think you're going to be around in a year, then... I can't make that purchase. So essentially anxiety is, is this the right product for me? And is this the right business for me to buy that product from? Yeah, and then we, nice. And, and then we move yeah. into the motivation side, which I kind of talked about earlier, which is the, uh, you know, does, does this excite me? Do I, do I feel like this is going to change my life? Um, do, I, do I see this product giving me the desired outcome that I want from this? Right, so you know, one example might be mowing the lawn. Right, I've I've got a, a lawn to mow. It's a it's a nightmare. Um, you know, if I if I wanted to buy a, a new lawn mower because I decide I don't want this cable one because I have to use an extension cord, I have to mow my lawn in like three sections because it's it's just long and thin. That's annoying. So maybe I want a battery powered one. All right, I need to feel that that lawn mower is going to cut my grass properly because that's the end result that I want. And also that I'm going to be able to do it in, in one battery pack. All right, so if I Go ahead, make my day. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> so it, yeah, if, if I believe that this lawnmower is going to get me there, then fine, I'm going to buy it. Nice, nice. Okay, Will, uh, let's talk about uh, something that I do a lot uh, and you know, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. I keep doing them, <laughs> but I don't know another way how to learn because I think everyone starts from best practices, generic strategy, then we can move on, you know, to adapt, to learn more. Can you list common mistakes that companies still do in your consulting experience and how you lead them in the right direction uh, that will provide uh, more sales and better results. Yeah. So, the, I mean, the biggest mistake is best practice, right? It's, um, it's people looking at big lists of changes they can make to a website and just making those changes or looking at really old case studies and using that as a way of determining what they should be AB testing, right? It's, it's, there's no strategy there. Um, they're not going to get anywhere. And, and a lot of the time when I see that happening, the pushback I get when we're trying to work with them is, oh, we've, we've tried CRO. It didn't work for us. It's like, well, you haven't tried CRO. 
you've you've made a few changes to your website you haven't measured anything you haven't tested it you don't have a clue really what you've done <laughs> what you've done to your website and uh, really the way it's, it's all the research that i talked about earlier right that's that's the stuff that makes a difference and, and helps a lot of brands understand what's actually required to make improvements to their website you know if you, if you look at best practice or also worse probably one of the worst things is apps at the moment so every app in the shopify store will say yeah improves your conversions by up to 40 percent or something something like that and obviously if you installed five of these apps you'd have an incredible conversion rate you'd, you'd suddenly be generating millions in revenue but it doesn't work like that because they are they're, they're, that 40 percent that they generated was for one business in a certain circumstance my guess would be not properly tested right oh uh, yeah that's that's something i want to comment on i saw an advert on facebook i'm being advertised um a, a cro person weirdly and he's he's in his comments he's put screenshots from google optimize saying oh yeah brilliant it's a 230 percent uplifting conversion or here's one that's like 93 percent and the vast majority of these tests he was showing were less than like 20 conversions for the variant right so of course of course that's possible right when using such a small data set so i think that's another big mistake people make is they end tests too early because they think the data is telling them that they've got a great winner or or a definite loser and i've seen so many tests flip the other way when they're left for the actual period of time required which is more like two weeks but it also depends on uh, it depends on the amount of traffic you're running through you know I, I did a test for a client and after about a week yeah because it was it was like a, it was a bit of a surprisingly long time so it was after about a week i think the test variant was up 140 percent right which sounds incredible and you're thinking oh we've run it for a week this is great but they were still you know, I think I think it, that very might have been close to a hundred conversions, which also you might think, okay, that's that's quite good. Um, but we let we let it run for another two weeks, and it, it was still a winner, but it was a winner at something like eight percent, right? Which is nearly as as impressive uh, as impressive sounding as one hundred and forty percent. So I think it's yeah, the biggest mistakes are um, just just running through a list of changes. To a website and, and expecting it to make change, make a difference without really knowing what you're doing. Um, running tests, uh, running tests without an actual research strategy, and and running tests for too short a period of time, and uh, and ending them before you actually have a a statistical result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, nice. Will I have the final question uh, according to your experience? Uh, you know, uh, for example, I found that I usually get uh, high results with customers who understand SEO. If they don't, I usually tell them, take my course, learn on Google, on YouTube, uh, because you need to understand the basic. And, you know, uh, it's interesting. I didn't create my course for the sake of um, uh, earning money. I usually, you know, sell this course for $10, $20, but I got experts like Lily Ray, uh, Jeff Coyle, Mike Phillips, many other great experts who share their experience, you know, uh, by, uh, on this course. And uh, it can help customers to understand SEO. Then we can cooperate together uh, like a cohesive team to achieve high results. Because, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of expert you can find. You need to understand the basic. And uh, it's the same like to lose weight. Yeah, if someone wanna lose weight without understanding why they need to eat healthy food, uh, drink a lot of water, you know, train hard. Um, yeah, I don't know how to lose weight if you don't understand. The best coach can help you, can't uh, decide all your issues, uh, and pills, medicine can help you as well. So, uh, yeah. can you tell, you know, uh, from your consulting experience, uh, how to start learning about content, uh, about uh, conversion rate optimization? Uh, from scratch for example if companies want to improve or uh yeah this uh, uh, uh 
uh, this uh, metric, but they don't know where to start, what to do. Can you tell how to get the basic knowledge, you know, then to cooperate with experts like you to increase sales? Yes, so um, I, I don't actually have much content myself, um, like, you know, many blog articles or a course or anything. So I'd probably recommend going to CXL, right? They are the best, um, you know, their, their content, their courses are just fantastic. So that's going to be the best place really to go. I mean, it, there's loads of advice from credible co uh, companies out there. So I'd just say, you know, if you're, if you're looking at some content or something, just have a think about who's actually produced this double, you know, double check in on them. Um, but yeah, I agree that it, it does help when people actually have an understanding of CRO, um, because I find that the people who don't, they expect their conversion rates to be doubled within, you know, a couple of months. They, they're expecting magic and it just doesn't work like that because ultimately um, if the traffic you're driving to your website is terrible, your conversion rate is going to be bad, right? And, and nothing I can do will fix that. Likewise, um, when we hit Black Friday, your conversion rate is going to go through the roof. But I, you know, I can't claim I've done anything to, for that. Um, and then obviously straight after Black Friday, your conversion rate is going to come back down. So there's, you know, it's understanding there is that seasonality on a, on a day by day basis. Um, you know, Johnny London, yeah, it was him. Um, he did a video where he showed off a graph, which was the day by day conversion rate for one of his clients. And he said at, at a random point on this graph, a 20% uplift had been uh, added to the conversion rate. And you, know, you, you couldn't really tell where it was. He, he, he points it out. It's, it's a really good video. Uh, I'd, I'd recommend going, going to look at it. But yeah, he says, you know, on a day by day basis, it's going to keep changing. You know, you're not going to see just a constant improvement in conversion rate because that's it just doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, there, nice. there, there are simply just days where people aren't in the mood to buy. I think I, I saw um, someone posted on LinkedIn today saying that um, Sundays, they're, they're seeing that Sundays are seeing about 30% more revenue than other days. Right, because people are people are at home, they're browsing, they're in a they're in a shopping mood on a, on a Sunday, mm -hmm. and then on Monday, maybe things aren't so good. So, it's, but there's nothing you can do about that on the website um, to try and to to stop that drop in conversion happen. It's going to happen. The best we can do is say, you know, if it, if your conversion rate on a day by day basis, which you shouldn't really be worrying about anyway, if you if your conversion rate currently drops from um, it doesn't even work this way. If your conversion rate is currently two and it drops to one, uh, the next day, you know, conversion rate optimization means you are at two and one percent and not uh, one point five and zero point five. Right? If we hadn't, yeah. if we hadn't made those changes. Nice, nice. Love it, love it. Will, it's a big pleasure to get on my show. You always share a lot of valuable insights. I need. You know, to spend time in an emergency room to consume all this information, you know, to think how I can implement uh, a lot of valuable insights. And uh, guys, I recommend 100% to follow Will uh, on uh, LinkedIn uh, at any other platforms because you can see a lot of value. Will, tell our audience the best way how to reach out to you, how to lo keep learning from you, how to follow you. Uh, yeah, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where I post everything. At the moment, um, post a lot of content there. Uh, I've got a newsletter, um, which you can you can find through LinkedIn as well, or um, yeah, head to customersuclick.com uh, to find out more about what we do. Nice, nice guys. You can find the links uh, uh, to uh, the link to LinkedIn account in the description below. Listen us on Apple, Google, Spotify. Thanks again for your time. Love it. So valuable. I recommend 100% to follow Will on LinkedIn to subscribe to his newsletter because you can see a lot of value. Okay, love you. See you.